Babkas are an incredibly popular rolled up filled sweet or savory bread enjoyed in many countries around the world. They have many variations including the British Chelsea buns and the American cinnamon roll. I don't know what version of swirled bread came first, but does it matter? Reality is they are all just rolled up in rich doughs filled with yummy goodness. Cinnamon and sugar are the most popular versions of all of these, but how about an enriched sweet potato swirl dough with a streusel topping and simple syrup soaked throughout? Now that's the babka recipe I'm sharing with you today. Babkas have been a traditional bread in Eastern European countries for centuries. The earliest recipes date back to Jewish housewives during the early 1800s. These ladies rolled hollow dough with cinnamon or jam. The bread wasn't as indulgent, moist, or soft as it is today. Since then though, babkas have taken on a world of their own with every possible flavor combination imaginable. There are as many savory babkas as there are sweet. Believe it or not, the former less appealing babkas were thought of like many Americans think of fruitcake. It was there, some people ate it, but most didn't enjoy it. It was considered stale and dry. However, we can think the TV show Seinfeld in the dinner party episode that aired over 27 years ago. Yeesh. That episode favoring chocolate babkas created quite the fuss. Check out that episode online to see why it started such a phenomenon in the United States. Nevertheless, with so many sweet and savory babka versions, this bread is going nowhere anytime soon. If anything, it will be reinvented a hundred if not a thousand more times. With that, let's check out my reinvention of the babka wheel. My sweet potato swirled babka with streusel topping. For the entire recipe ingredients, You'll need yeast, granulated sugar, milk, all-purpose flour, orange zest, which is optional, two eggs, vanilla extract, butter, salt, sweet potatoes, brown sugar, cinnamon, and nutmeg. Step one is to make the bread dough. So first we need to activate the yeast. And in order to do that, we need to heat up a quarter of a cup of milk. And I'm just going to heat mine in the microwave for about 20 seconds. We want it to reach 100 to 110 degrees. You can also heat this up over the stove if you choose. Okay, perfect. 110 degrees. You need to measure out 75 grams of sugar. That's going to be about a third of a cup plus two teaspoon. In a small bowl, we're going to sort of mix all this together with our yeast. So you need two and a quarter teaspoon of yeast, and that's one package of yeast from the store. To the yeast, and from that 75 grams of sugar, you're going to take out one tablespoon. You're gonna mix it in with the yeast, and this is just gonna help activate the milk a little faster. When you're using milk, you don't necessarily have to add sugar to it because milk has lactose in it, and that is a sugar, so it, could it would technically froth the yeast and make it active, but I like to add a little bit of sugar just because it makes it active a little bit quicker. Then just pour in your milk, and then just whisk it all together. So then we're gonna set this aside for 10 minutes until the yeast has activated, meaning it'll become bubbly and frothy. So now it's time to mix the dry ingredients. So in the bowl of a stand mixer, if you're just using your hands to knead, you could use just a regular large bowl, but I like my stand mixer for this. We're gonna add 400 grams of flour, and I've already measured mine out, but 400 grams is about three and a quarter cups. To that, we're gonna add the remaining sugar that we measured out. Remember, it was originally 75 grams. We took out one tablespoon so that we can activate the yeast. That's the rest of it. I'm gonna add one teaspoon of salt because I'm using salted butter, but if you're using unsalted butter, just add one and a quarter teaspoons of salt. And then to that, we're gonna add one teaspoon of orange zest. You don't have to put orange zest in this, but this is more of an autumn type flavored bread. And so I really like the orange zest in my recipe here. And it just gives it a little bit of freshness and fall flavor. And then we're just whisking it up. It's time to heat up the liquid. So we're going to heat up a half a cup of milk in the microwave or over the stove, again, until it reaches that 100 to 110 degrees. Start with 20 seconds and you can always add more time if you need to. And then in a small bowl, you wanna cut up your butter and we're gonna melt the butter. We're using one stick of butter, which is four ounces and I measured my butter out. All right, our milk is ready. So now we need to melt the butter. 20 seconds in the microwave. 
stirring it. After the 20 seconds, you should have a few little solids in there, but we want them all just melted so it's not too hot to negatively affect our yeast in our dough. Okay, we're just gonna stir until all these solids are melted and the temperature should be okay to add to our dough. Okay, now it's time to mix everything up. Place your bowl in the mixer, you need to attach the dough hook, and we're just gonna pretty much put everything in as this is slowly moving. But I wanna show you the yeast. Notice that it's been about 10 minutes, it's frothy, it's bubbly, it's active, and it's ready to go into our mixture. We're gonna be adding two eggs one at a time, and I've already cracked one and put in a bowl to show you that we wanna add them without having any shells in them, and it's easiest to do it when you have a separate bowl. Go ahead and turn your mixture on low. And then to that, we're gonna slowly add in all of our wet ingredients. So we're gonna start with the yeast mixture. We're gonna add the milk. Pour in the butter. We're gonna add a half a teaspoon of vanilla. And one egg at a time. Go ahead and stop after you've added all the ingredients and then scrape down the edge of your bowl. And you may need to do that periodically. We're gonna need this on eight minutes from starting on low, slowly moving up to medium speed until the dough is elastic, and you should see it pull away from the bowl. If the dough is tacky, that's great. You don't need to add any extra flour, but if it's sticky, you need to add about a tablespoon of flour and continue to add more until it, the dough is no longer sticky. Just after a couple of minutes, the dough is already starting to come together. All right, our lovely dough is finished. Take a look at that. It has been pulling away from the edges of the bowl as it was kneading, and it's a nice dough. It's, not, it's definitely that tacky feel, but it's not sticky. I mean, I'm not getting any much dough on my fingers, so that's the right consistency there. And I didn't add any more flour. This is right at 400 grams, but you may need to depending on your environment. All right, let's just scrape down the edges just to make sure everything is sort of together, because now it's time to let it rise. All right, that's a pretty looking dough. And let me tell you, that orange zest, oh, it is like, it totally feels like holidays to me. I just, I love adding orange zest to my holiday dough, particularly if it's a sweet dough. So this is where we stop for a while. And we're gonna add either a towel or a plastic wrap to the top of this, and we're gonna sit it in a warm place to rise, and it should double in size. Now, because this is a bit of a, of a dense dough, because it is an enriched dough, it's gonna take an hour and a half to two hours. Um, when I make this, it's usually two hours, so it does take a bit of time, uh, but you're looking for that to double in size, so it may not take you as long, but just keep an eye on it, check it in an hour, see where it is, and then go from there. So the second step is to prepare the sweet potato filling. In fact, for the sweet potato filling, you could use your leftover sweet potato casserole for this filling, or you can make my version right here. Very simple, easy to do. All you need is to wash and peel and dice at least um, one pound of potatoes. And if you're using your sweet potato filling from your casserole, then all you need to do is use about one to one and a half cups of that. And that should be enough for two loaves of bread, which is what we're gonna be making today. But if you're making my version here, then just chop up your sweet potatoes. I already have one in the pan here and you're gonna place it in a saucepan. So I'm gonna place my other one in the saucepan. We're gonna cover it with cold water. Cold water is better than hot because we want our sweet potatoes to cook evenly. And you can only do that with cold water. So just cover your potatoes. We're gonna put them over the stove and boil them. And when the water comes to a boil, we're gonna turn the heat down to a simmer and then let them cook for 15 minutes. Our potatoes have been simmering for about 15 minutes. If you wanna make sure they're done, pick out a potato that looks fairly large of the bunch and then just pierce it with a knife with a fork. If it cuts through smoothly, and easily, then they're ready. So mine are, so the next step is to drain them and we're gonna let them sit in the colander for a bit, let them drain a little bit longer while we prepare the bowl. So in a large bowl, I'm gonna add one ounce of butter, that's two tablespoons, and I diced mine up and I also like to put it at the bottom of the bowl because the heat from the potatoes will help to soften the butter. And as long as your butter is in chunks, then you have less mass for the heat to melt, so everything is much quicker. So on top of this butter, we're gonna add our one pound of potatoes. Let's add the flavorings to it, additional flavoring to the sweet potato. Quarter cup of packed brown sugar. Pack that sugar into your cup. We want a nice amount of sweetness. Quarter of a teaspoon of cinnamon. And then we're gonna add some nutmeg. You can buy the ground nutmeg in the store, but I highly recommend if you've never done it, 
buy the big nutmeg nuts. It's called nutmeg, right? It looks like a nut. It does, it looks like a small pecan. And you grate the whole thing. So like once you start grating on the inside, it's got that little creamy white and nut color swirls in it. And you just take a little grater, you just grate it in there. I like to grate mine in a separate bowl because I wanna make sure I get the right amount and not too much. So I'll grate it into a bowl and then I'll measure it out. And that's an eighth of a teaspoon of fresh nutmeg. Now, if you don't like nutmeg, you don't have to use it. It's just an ingredient that I really like. And that nutmeg, oh my goodness, as I was grating it, I could stand back here and smell it. It is, just permeates the room and it smells like holidays to me. Just love fresh nutmeg for that nice aroma. Then you could use a potato masher if you want. I just like to use my hand mixer. It just makes it easy to mix it all up and just turn it on and mix it up until it's nice and smooth. Just take a little spatula and make sure everything is all in there and combined. And there you are. It's about as smooth as you're gonna get a sweet potato because they're a bit stringy, right? Just in, in general, but that's what we're looking for. So we're just gonna set our potatoes aside for the time being, let them cool a bit, and they can just stay on the counter until we're ready to fill our dough. It's time for our third step, which is to make the streusel topping. So you need a small bowl, doesn't have to be very large. And to that, we're gonna add a fourth of a cup of flour, and then two tablespoons of packed brown sugar. Just make sure you pack that brown sugar into your tablespoon. Eighth of a teaspoon of salt. Then using a pastry cutter like I have here, just sort of quickly mix it all together. All right, and then I am adding two tablespoons of butter, which is an ounce. And then I'm just gonna cut that in with my pastry cutter. Of course, this is where you could use your hands. Some people like to be able to fill the butter with their hands as they uh, break it up. You could use two forks, I've done that. Move this around until everything is sort of well combined until you have a grainy, chunky consistency. All right, we're pretty much there. Let's take a look, test it out. Yep, nice and chunky. That's what we're looking for. This is what's gonna go on top of the babka and give it that little extra richness and sweetness. Our streusel topping is ready, so I'm just gonna put this in the fridge until we're ready to top our babka. So our fourth step is to fill and twist the bread dough, but first we need to prepare our pans. So you're gonna need two by five inch loaf pans. It also works if you have a nine by five and an eight and a half by four and a half, which is what I have here. So they don't have to be exactly the same size, the bread will still turn out wonderfully. And you need to either grease them with butter, shortening, cooking spray, or line them with parchment paper. I prefer parchment paper because when the dough is baked, it's easy just to lift up that parchment paper and place it on a cooling rack. We're we'll having to turn your pans over to release the bread. So I find it this is the easiest for me. All right, let's take a look at the dough. It's ready, it has risen. I let mine go two hours and it is beautiful. Take a look at that dough, it's doubled and it's not deflated anyway, so we haven't over proofed it. You can smell that orange zest in it. Oh, between the nutmeg and the orange zest and the sweet potatoes. Oh my goodness, it is definitely full, and, that, and the cinnamon. Okay, so on a heavily floured surface, because we're gonna roll this dough out after we divide it, and we wanna make sure that it doesn't stick to our work surface. So what I like to do is to get my dough in a nice little sort of a rectangle here, kind of like an oblong rectangle, because it's gonna make it easier to cut in half. And then with a, a knife, or I'm using my little bench cutter here, try to eyeball half and half. And you don't have to weigh this out. It's gonna be, be close enough just by eyeballing it. Put one half aside. And so I actually have two work surfaces that I'm working on. You don't have to. Just put one half in a bowl and let it sit there until you're ready for it. But for ease of you seeing what's happening here, I'm using two work surfaces. We're gonna roll these using a rolling pin. You wanna flour it pretty well. And we're gonna roll each of these into about a 16 by 12 inch rectangle. We're making like a cinnamon roll because we're gonna make those swirls and we're gonna roll our sweet potato filling in the dough. So think of a cinnamon roll as you're making this. It's easier when you start from the center when you're rolling. It sort of keeps everything uniformly about the same width. Both my rectangles are about 16 long and 12 wide. Okay, so now we're gonna add our sweet potato filling. And you only want really a cup to a cup and a half max for split between both of these. 
Um, and I'm going to tell you, if you put too much, check out my photo here. That's what happened when I made one of these and I put way too much sweet potato filling. There was too much moisture in the dough. And even though the internal temperature reached 200 degrees, that dough was so moist that it couldn't bake in the center and it fell. And you want to go from edge to edge, end to end. So this is the most that you want on each of these. Notice I still have a little bit of sweet potato left over. This makes a great snack. But you want to be able to see a little bit of the dough underneath it, so it should be just a nice, smooth, thin layer. Then you're going to start at one of the short ends, and you're just going to try to tightly roll this up as much as you can. Again, we're thinking of this like a jelly roll or a cinnamon roll. Let's do the other one. Same thing. We're going to wrap each of these in plastic wrap and place them in the fridge for about 15 to 20 minutes and allow that butter to solidify just slightly so it'll firm up. Take a piece of plastic wrap and then you're just going to transfer the loaf onto the wrap and then just cover it up. To make it easy to transfer these from fridge to counter, counter to fridge, once you've gotten them all in plastic, make them easy to lift up and just place them on a cookie sheet. In the refrigerator, they're going to go for 15 or 20 minutes. Remove one loaf from the refrigerator, and we're going to place the other one back in the refrigerator until we're ready to shape it. Go ahead and unwrap your log and move it over to a floured surface. All right, we're going to work with one log first, and then we'll do the same with the second log. So on a floured surface with your log, you want to take a serrated knife or a bench scraper. I actually prefer the serrated knife because I don't want to smush down my dough. I want to be able to slice through it. And eyeball it and try to get your knife about halfway through where you cut your dough. And once you've sliced it, go ahead and open up the two halves so that you can see the inside, and the inside should be facing up. Okay, and then just put them close together. Look at all those nice layers. It's beautiful. Because this is where we make the babka part. This is what makes it uniquely different from like a cinnamon roll. So instead of slicing it into 12 slices, we're going to twist this with an open face up. So that's all you're doing. You're just twisting the dough over, keeping those layers face up because that's what we want to be able to see at the top of our loaf pan. And then I like to squish mine down a little bit toward us together because we have to put it in that loaf pan, remember? And that loaf pan is not very long. Carefully pick up your bread dough and then we're just going to put it in there nicely. Might need to squeeze it in just a little bit more, but don't squeeze it in too much because we don't want to mess up those layers. That's one. Okay, now let's get the other one. Both pans are ready to rise. Love looking at that beautiful swirls of sweet potato in that dough. So holiday. I'm gonna use the same plastic wrap I used to cover the dough in. And I'm gonna spray it with cooking spray because that dough is definitely going to rise and it's gonna to touch the bottom of the plastic and we don't want the dough to stick. So spray it. Gently just, you just want to cover it enough so that the drafts don't get in. Leave room so that as the dough rises, it has room to rise. So I'm going to place my loaves over on the stove where it's warm and just leave them there for about an hour to an hour and a half. They're not going to double in size, but we just want them to rise a little bit and then they'll rise more in the oven. We're in the last 30 minutes of our rise, so go ahead and preheat your oven to 350 degrees. The dough has risen, so it's time to add the toppings. Now, it just, it's really just more of a, a good risen puffy. It's not doubled in size or anything, but it looks exactly the way it should. Pretty loaves, huh? So for both loaves, we're going to add some melted butter and we're just going to brush it on. I just heated up about two tablespoons of butter in the microwave. And we're just going to gently brush it on the bread dough. So the reason we're putting the butter on the loaves is so that the topping will help stay on the dough as the dough is rising and as it is baking. And of course it doesn't hurt to have a little extra flavor from butter on your, your bread. Then we have our wonderful topping that we prepared and had in the refrigerator. Sprinkle it on both loaves and try to divide it in half. Just take your hands and gently pat the topping into the loaves because we want to make sure that that topping sticks to the butter and the loaf so that it doesn't fall off as it rises. You could also lift up the parchment paper on the edges 
and that as the dough rises will prevent the topping from falling off the paper. And then we're gonna place them both on a cookie sheet and this will of course keep anything that happens to rise above the pan if it should, anything that falls off will not fall off onto the oven floor. Place the cookie sheet with both loaves of bread on a center rack in the oven and we're gonna bake for our first 30 minutes, after which bake for another 30 minutes. All right, I'll see you in 30. We're 30 minutes into baking the bread. Check your bread and make sure that it's not darkening too quickly on top. If it is, just add a sheet of foil. You don't have to tuck it in really tight. Just put it on top. It'll prevent it from the top from burning as it's cooking. So we still have another 20 to 30 minutes of baking. If it's not cooking too fast, it's not browning too much on top, you don't have to put foil on it. Just look in the door and see if it's browning too quickly. If it is, at any point, just add the foil. So go ahead and add another 20 to 30 minutes to the timer if you haven't already. So now we're at step five, which is to prepare the simple syrup. Now you don't have to do simple syrup for this bread. Basically, it's just a last little addition of indulgence to pour over the bread once it's baked. But it's very simple to make simple syrup. Just get a saucepan. We're gonna pour in equal parts of water and sugar. That's it. So I have a third of a cup of water and a third of a cup of sugar. And we're gonna simmer it over a low to medium heat until the sugar dissolves. Whisk it while it's heating up. And as you can see right now, the water is a little cloudy. That's because the sugar hasn't dissolved. So you know your sugar's dissolved when you can no longer see it and it's really clear and it's not gritty or grainy at all. This is the reason I love to use super fine granulated sugar because it will melt and dissolve very, very quickly. My simple syrup is done. It only took about three to four minutes for it to completely dissolve. Set this aside and let it cool and then we'll pour it over our bread loaves when they come out of the oven. Babka bread just came out of the oven. Mine took about an hour and eight minutes. You know when your babka's done, when you put the thermometer in it and the internal temperature is 200 degrees. That's the number we're looking for for this particular bread. Step six, which is to add the finishing touches and then allow the bread to cool before we dig in. While the bread is still warm, if you want to do the simple syrup, you don't have to. This, you could just eat it like this and this would be great. But simple syrup is traditional in the Eastern European cultures that bake this bread. So I'm just gonna add it because it's why not? <laughs> and I can. With an ice pick or a skewer or whatever you have, you're just gonna poke holes throughout the bread, getting it on holes on the edges and in the center. Again, the point is to make space for the simple syrup to soak up into the bread. I like to pour my simple syrup into a measuring cup. It just makes it easier to pour onto the bread loaves as well as to equally distribute the liquid. Just slowly pour it over the loaves, pouring it on the edges and in the center. We're gonna let the loaves sit in the paper and in the pans for about 10 to 20 minutes, and then we will remove the paper from the pans with the loaves in them and let them cool completely before we cut into them. After about 20 minutes in the pan, you're just going to take the loaves out of the main pan and put them on a cooling rack. Very simple, this is why I like to use the parchment paper because it happens this quickly. Just like that, now they can cool for the rest of the time. If you did not use parchment paper, if you greased your pan, just take a knife before you take the loaves out, run the knife along the edge just to make sure there's no sticking and then tilt the pan to the side and help it, the loaves come out and then you can put them on the cooling rack. So let's cut into this beautiful bread and take a closer look. There you are, pretty tops. All right, so I'm gonna cut into one of these. Let's take a look at the inside of this. Ooh, look at this pretty swirls. It's like a piece of art. Just perfectly dispersed throughout. That's a pretty bread. And notice the streusel on the top. Love, love, love that. And it's just a well-cooked baked bread. You wanna talk about holiday smell? Ooh, I can smell the orange, I can smell the sweet potato, I can smell the yeasted dough with the enriched butter in there as well. Let's look at the tear of this dough. Oh, it's nice. And because it's layered, you can see the layers in it and the layers actually pull apart in layer form. It feels like a really good enriched dough. Let's give it a taste. Hey, Scott. Hey. Welcome to Babka Day. Yeah, happy Babka Day. I like it. We should go with that from now on. This day every year. Works for me. This babka has a, an enriched sweet bread dough 
with swirled flavors reminiscent of fall and the holidays. So I hope you're excited. Yeah, as excited as I get. Yeah, that's true. I'll be excited for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> I am looking forward to you trying this bread. So go ahead and give it a go and let's see what, what you think. Babkas, if you don't know, are an Eastern European bread originally made by Jewish families using challah dough. And we had that in the springtime, if you recall. Mm -hmm. It's an enriched dough with swirls of spiced sweet potato with a nice drusel topping. And then there's a bonus of a simple syrup that's been poured over the bread after it was baked. Extra flavor. What are your thoughts? Um, it's a good dessert bread. Would be good with a cup of coffee or something. A good ratio of the, of the bread to the sweet potato. Nice. Because if you can see, it's beautiful. It's got those nice swirls throughout. There's not one layer that's concentrated. So I love the fact that it's all spread out because of the thinness of the dough and then the light coating of the sweet potato. So it was a perfect ratio. Uh, I like the streusel topping and I can taste the, did you say there's a, a sweet drizzle? Yeah, there should be a little bit of moisture to the bread and that's going to be the simple syrup. It's just sugar that's been dissolved in water. Well, it's hard to tell if it's that or if it's the sweet potato, but it's, it's not a dry bread for sure. Good. Just so you know, as a Seinfeld watcher, I know that you were. You would appreciate knowing this. But this bread's popularity in the United States is a result of the dinner party episode in one of the Seinfeld seasons. I think it was season five. Hmm. And it was where Jerry and Elaine were at the bakery picking up a chocolate babka for a dinner party and they didn't have it. They were totally out of it. And so the woman tried to send them on cinnamon and they were like, cinnamon? They wanted the chocolate. Do you remember that episode? I do. I think I would have wanted the cinnamon though. <laughs> and you know but what? It was a yeah. show about nothing. True. So it doesn't really matter. Right. right? <laughs> we'll have to watch it again for our newfound knowledge and appreciation for the spread, I think. In general for babkas, for storing them, wrap them well and store them at room temperature for a few days. The moisture from this simple syrup will keep the babkas from drying out. That means we can keep them on the counter for a while. So see the recipe in the link for additional storage details, and that's below the video here. Babkas are such beautiful breads, worthy of any guest or celebration. I hope you guys give these a try and let me know in the comment section about your experience. Well, thanks for watching, subscribing, liking, and sharing my videos. Your support is much appreciated. And until next time, go bake the world.